Hi, you are here for um, navigation failures in uh, ports with devices. We are, my name is Sergey Kanjelev. I'm chair of Signode and one of the approvers. I work for GKE and sometimes I'm on call for Node. And many of these nodes these days uh, have accelerators. So every time something failed, I will know about it and I will dig into that and, oh, it's a device failed. We need to deal something uh, with that somehow. And um, I'm by no means a professional in accelerators. I don't know much about them, but I don't know, I, I know enough to how they affect Kubernetes. And Runal? Uh, hey folks, I'm Runal. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. I'm one of the tech leads and co-chairs of Signode. And our goal today is to figure out how we can better surface device uh, issues from pods and uh, better support AI ML workloads. So motivation, like modern workloads use a lot of new devices beyond just CPU memory and network, right? You have your accelerator cards, you have specialized uh, network devices and so on. So AI ML training can run for weeks to months. So uh, any device failures could drastically slow you down and it can be frustrating. And we want uh, Kubernetes to be the platform that can be used uh, for all these use cases. So uh, visibility into this device failures and automatic remediation uh, is the goal that we want to work towards. So uh, if folks have seen uh, the Llama paper, they cite that uh, during training Llama, 78% of the uh, interruptions were due to hardware issues and 59% uh, were because of GPU issues. So this is like some motivation on why we need to address this. So you just saw numbers in red, right? So number in red is how many times device failed. And you remember about Kubernetes. Kubernetes is, I mean, in Kubernetes, you provision the node. You barely can change the size of it in CPU and memory. Uh, and if you have a device, you either have it or you don't have it. That was a pattern for a very long time. And with this pattern, like we survived for many years, and now with AI ML going, uh, being dominant uh, uh, workload that we want to serve, it's a change of paradigm. And why would people use Kubernetes for this change of paradigm? Why are people still running on Kubernetes if it's not designed for AI ML? Like maybe we need to switch to something else. Uh, this question we heard a lot, uh, especially past year. And I think many people already settled on that, but I just want to reiterate on that. Why this talk is even happening? Why are we talking about AI ML and Kubernetes and not talking about let's build something new, some new frameworks that will know about device failures, that will know about specifics of these workloads. So containers became a standard of publishing applications. So people know how to do containers, how to version containers, how to layer containers, how to secure containers. And this infrastructure is not going anywhere. And Kubernetes is a good way to serve containers. Plus, Kubernetes has years of security, reliability, uh, investments that uh, needs to be matched by any new framework that can come up. That's why Kubernetes is still very valuable. And every framework that will want to compete with Kubernetes for AI ML will need to go through the, the same years of maturing Plus, implement many, many features similar to Kubernetes, like autoscaler and uh, stuff like that. So even though Kubernetes is not ideal for AI ML today, uh, we believe we can make it great for AI ML, and many people already settled on running AI ML workload on uh, Kubernetes. So let's talk about what AI ML workloads are. I'm trying to oversimplify here. Like I know that like so many details and you can run this in this mode or that in this mode. So if you look at types of workloads we typically observe, it's a either training workload. Uh, training workload is uh, often running on many, many machines. Uh, typically takes whole machine, uh, all GPUs on these machines because it's just more efficient. And it typically runs as a gang, like as many, many pods running together, scheduled together, working to the completion of a step, and then next step executes. And then working to completion next step, and next step executes. And uh, typically, if one pod is lagging behind, whole step is, uh, uh, needs to be redone from beginning. Uh, Inference workload is different. Uh, typically, I mean, inference can be 
any size. Uh, we see inference very small, inference very big. It can spawn across multiple nodes, or it can uh, take part partial um, a GPU. So it's, there are different uh, inference workloads. But what is different about inference is uh, typically, I know the batch inference, but typically it's continuously running. Typically it's restart policy always. And uh, it uh, also requires heavy file with weights to serve the model. So you need to download it somehow, either from uh, image store or from uh, storage, but uh, it's a very specific for uh, serving that weights are very heavy. And looking at these workloads, you can see how assumptions that we previously made in Kubernetes for typical workload are changing. So you, in the past, you can just give better CPU or bigger CPU, and everything works just fine, just faster. Same comes with uh, failure uh, modes. Like if something failed, you just recreate it. No matter where you recreate it, you can recreate it on this node, on that node, it doesn't really matter. Nobody cared. Uh, with the AML, you care a lot because every reallocation recreation is a uh, heavy operation, and you're spending valuable cycles of uh, uh, your very expensive hardware standing, uh, not doing anything. Also, um, uh, another assumption was any node uh, will work. Like as I said previously, you can just assume that uh, you can schedule an, any node. Many workload needs to run on specific devices, specific device class, and you, sometimes it's even not only device class, but also which device connected to which other device on other node. It adds a lot of complexity how we schedule things, and uh, it brings more challenges uh, that typically weren't a problem in, uh, before. And then uh, you can uh, read the other thing, but uh, uh, what I want to point here is that uh, every port becomes become very expensive and cherished entity. So you, you, you want to uh, approach the port as a pet. You need to cherish it. You need to keep it alive. You need to uh, make sure it's uh, not interrupted. And then uh, with, uh, and with, when in the past it was uh, cattle, so you can schedule that anywhere. It will work uh, no matter what. So with that, I want to say that um, when we see AIML working on um, Kubernetes, we know that existing failure model works uh, for many cases of Kubernetes. It's still failure. We still know how to deal with these failures. But uh, one, Kubernetes has barely knows about devices and device health. And second, every like how the way we handle uh, failures in Kubernetes is very expensive for AIML workload. And now we will go into specific failure modes, and we will discuss how this failure mode uh, operates and how, what you can do uh, with this failure mode. Okay. So first is my favorite failure mode. It's Kubernetes Infra. It's like when Kubernetes Infra is not up to your satisfaction. And this is uh, the mode I can do the best, uh, uh, I can do the most about, because it's like, it's a Kubernetes. I do Kubernetes. I can fix it up. So let's see how a typical AIML workload is being scheduled with devices. So if you have, if you have a device, you need to uh, tell Kubernetes that you have this device. And Kubelet has no knowledge about this device, so we have a pluggable model. And I'm listing here device plugin model. I don't list DRA because for, with DRA, we, uh, some problems will be solved. There are new problems, but uh, this is what we have today. With device plugin, device plugin gives information about uh, devices to Kubelet uh, via watch uh, uh, interface. And this watch interface can say, I have that many devices and all of them healthy. And then when one goes unhealthy, it will mark it as unhealthy. Uh, it also, uh, the same interface is used to, for Kubla to ask to allocate resources for port. Um, and then device plugin will allocate it and uh, t tell how exactly uh, map uh, this device to container. And then uh, Kubla also reports uh, node status at how many devices it knows about to um, API server in terms of allocatable and capacity, as well as uh, whenever um, it sees a user port, it goes through this process of allocating it and making sure that there are devices for this port to execute. So you see like so many components and there is like iteration, like how everything registers and how everything works. 
involves many, many steps. Like first, device plugin reports about itself. Kubelet reports about devices uh, to API server. API server knows about this device's schedule spot. What comes to the node and Kubelet will allocate. Uh, and then uh, if it's allocated successfully, it will run the spot. If you ever did an analysis of uh, reliability of components, uh, you know, like uh, you draw a schema and then on every arrow it will ask you, what if this error fails? So imagine uh, this uh, failure mode, and we see a lot of that. Like I, I, in, in uh, all the on-call uh, that I made and all the customer issues I've been looking at, there is a lot of situations like that. So imagine many customers, for some reason, will need to restart Kubelet. So they have some custom configurations they need to apply before they run a uh, port. So they restart the Kubelet. And it's a benign operation, typically. But in case of device plugin, while Kubelet is restarting, it's forgetting about devices. So there is a period of time when there is no information about devices. So uh, you have a new port. You cannot schedule it because there is no devices. Kubelet just doesn't know yet about it. Yes, it's a couple seconds of uh, while it doesn't know about it, but two seconds is a lot of time uh, when you're thinking about race conditions and uh, how fast everything works. Then device plugin. Device plugin can be updated. Like in, if you update a device plugin, we don't support overlapping updates, so you need to turn down one device plugin, create a new device plugin, it will connect to Kubelet, and report about these devices, but you have a period of time when there is no devices. Kubelet, again, doesn't know about the devices. It cannot schedule anything, it cannot allocate. Um, and furthermore, there are situations when device plugin is not updated normally, but it was evicted for some reason. So you have too many things running on this node, and then uh, Kubelet just decides that uh, device plugin is the least important port, and it will just kick it out. Um, yeah, uh, we have mechanism to prevent that, but those mechanism doesn't work all the time. And then there are other situations like uh, um, user ports. User ports comes in all flavors, and people do code mistakes. And these mistakes uh, comes in shapes of like I, I define the long graceful termination, and now when I unscheduling port, it uh, some somehow stuck in termination, and like. Good is a graceful termination, and uh, Kubelet knows about it, but what if it's termination with uh, like unattaching some volume? And this termination is called outside of Kubelet knowledge, and then it's stuck with owning this device, and then there is like, a situation when you cannot schedule a new port while old port is still in this like, limbo state. So there are lots of different race conditions and uh, situations like that. And uh, the best practices we can recommend today without making improvements in Kubelet that we plan to do um, is just make sure that you configured Kubelet in ahead of time. Don't try to configure it while you schedule your uh, device-related uh, device ports. Uh, you also need to monitor device plugin health. Yes, many clouds provide this functionality for you, but you also, like if you're running it yourself or even if you have a problem and you don't know what to look, just look at device plugin. Maybe it's, uh, it was evicted. And then uh, try not to run too many things on the node. Yes, you have wasted CPU on this node, but don't use it all. Otherwise, something will be ev evicted and it will go unstable and you're wasting valuable hardware time. And then, uh, yeah, this is one example from logs from one of the uh, support cases when device plugin uh, that we had had some issue and uh, it was uh, failing to detect one of the devices and it was crashing and we end up with deleting this node, creating another node, deleting the node again, creating it again. So we get into a very bad situation. So please avoid the situation and monitor your device plugin. Another infra-related thing, but it's not like Kubernetes infra, it's more of a, a vendor infra is the situation with uh, device version mismatch. So now we have a uh, device, and this device needs to have some plugins installed. You install plugins for the device, uh, and then ports that you install also need to be compatible with this plugin. So now you're not only looking at which device class you want, but also which drivers are installed on a node that you will be running on. And it's like, typically it's not a problem, typically there are like, range of compatibility is large, but we see problems now and when, uh, now and then that uh, this mismatch happens. And with more technologies like Nickel for um, like running network more efficiently, you have more drivers now. So you need to coordinate between two drivers, three drivers, and then versioning becomes a little bit hectic and uh, uh, you need to make sure that you have some processes in place to make sure that uh, you don't get into these troubles. 
And this process may be like uh, monitor driver installation. Uh, sometimes it fails. Uh, make sure that you have some upgrade plan, and this upgrade plan now not only includes when you upgrade nodes, but also includes how you upgrade nodes and then upgrade ports to match the version of the driver. And then um, have some canary environment. It's always a good idea. It's not always possible with heavy devices because they are expensive and they are in uh, shortage, but please try to think how you can be creative and uh, uh, test it before you go into full mode on uh, full scale in production. And with that, I want to pass to device, as a device, uh, further more to Murunao. Uh, all right, so what are some ways we work around uh, the issues and what we can do right now before we go into solutions? So you can have a health controller, right? So if your device plug-in, uh, the controller can check whether allocatable is equal to the capacity uh, or not. If a device failed, then the allocatable will be less than capacity, and your controller can then wait for a grace period and then take the node down. But that's not really great, right? Because we don't know the root cause uh, of the issue with the device. It's not aware of the workload. It's possible that the device that failed was not even in use. Uh, and sometimes this process is too, low, uh, is too slow because you're waiting for some time. And then a node may be part of a slice, and you cannot just simply delete it. And then you end up with a lot of uh, custom configuration to handle this. So another way, uh, so what can you do at the pod level, right? If you, if you don't want to take away the node entirely. So your pod can define special error codes and then uh, have a pod failure policy. For example, if the pod can detect a device uh, fail, then it can have a special error code for that and then it can retry. Or if it, it's an application error, then it can just fail. Now, the problem with this is it will only work with jobs with restart policy equal to never. And we are not really surfacing the issue that the device failed, which we'll talk about in, in the future solutions section. Uh, yet another solution is uh, you can have a pod watcher. Uh, this pod can keep uh, watching your pods. And if, if a pod is failing, it's in a crash loop back off, then it, it can get deleted by the controller. But with this, you don't know uh, what actually happened, whether there was a device failure or there was an application failure causing the pod to uh, go into this mode. So uh, what if there's an application failure, right? So since AI ML pods are uh, heavy to start, they need device allocation and so on, it may make sense to just reschedule them or start them in place instead of trying to start a new pod entirely. And also remember like these pods, like for example, take leader worker set. It has a collection of pods that need to work together. So you're not just worried about one pod, but you're worried about like restarting a bunch of pods together, which is going to be expensive and time consuming. So yet another class of uh, issue is device degradation. So this is even worse. This is the case where the device is working, but it's not performing uh, the way it's supposed to perform. It's, it's working slow, or it's, it has some edge cases. So how do you even detect that? So maybe you can have some metrics, you can have some performance measurements, and then if, you're, if your workload is not progressing at the rate it's expected to, uh, your custom controller can act on it. So what do we do in terms of monitoring today? So on the kubelet, we have the pod resources API. It's a node local kubelet gRPC API. Uh, so you can have a privileged daemon set running on each node, connecting to the kubelet and gather, gathering information through this API. So it, through this API, you can get device assignment information you can know the st status of the devices and so on. So this is used by monitoring agents such as the NVIDIA's uh, DCGM. It's also used by Multis. However, the downside is that this is like a backend way to surface information about devices, right? And you also need a privileged daemon set. Ideally, this information should be surfaced up to a pod. So now Sergey will talk about uh, what we are trying to do to address these issues. Thank you, Mrunal. Yeah, so we just walk through 
many DUI solution do it yourself. Like you have this kind of failure, do this. You can, this kind of error, do that. And every time it's a very custom, you need to know what your workload is doing, how it is doing, and uh, what kind of reaction you want to apply to that. And what we discovered over time is that every time we talk to customers and saying, what can we do in Kubernetes to help you? And often we, see, we hear very conflicting messages. Like some people will say, oh, when device fails, immediately like, scroll, uh, like remove my port. And other, and other people say, no, you need to do it very slowly. You need to give us a lot of uh, graceful de de uh, degradation time and maybe not even like touch it for a while. Um, so looking at all of that, we said that we want to take like slow approach to that. We cannot just start introducing breaking changes because many, many do-it-yourself solutions already working. They already being implemented. And if you will break some backward compatibility and start implementing behaviors that wasn't implemented before, we break more deployments that we can save. So that's why we want to do it slowly. We want to do it step by step. And mostly we prioritize new extensibility points and new information uh, exposure rather than behavior change of kubelet. So first failure mode, as we discussed, is uh, Kubernetes infra fail, uh, changes, uh, breakages. And as I said, it's my favorite one because we can do a lot about it. We know how Kubernetes works. We know how to make it more reliable, uh, less race conditioning. Uh, that's why we implement, uh, we invest in here a lot. And we started with small steps like uh, if my endpoint is not working on Kubelet, let's restart Kubelet. I mean, it's the easiest we can do. Uh, but then in future, we have a lot of plans how to uh, minimize number of uh, race conditions, um, how to minimize number of downtimes. One of the biggest requests right now is how do we deploy a new version of the device plugin or DRA without removing the old one so they can swap immediately. That's a very nice feature to have. We don't have it yet, and I hope that we can implement it soon, uh, and we have an active uh, issue about that. Other things is uh, um, I just restarted Kubelet, and I want to readmit all my ports. How I make sure that device plugin has time to register all, um, all the devices before I start readmitting the ports? And for that, we also have an issue, and we have a, a very nice and elegant uh, solution that may not even require a cap. So it's uh, some retries that we can add on pod admission that are benign enough for any other workload, but help drastically for device plugin scenarios. And we have uh, some other ideas how to improve this uh, model. So we're basically looking at diagrams that we had before and trying to optimize every single step there, every single arrow, and make sure that if this error, error fail, what do we do? Is this error fail, what do we do? Um, and by the way, we, in DRA, we started with like uh, testing of uh, failed conditions. In device plugin, we didn't even have failed condition tests. Now we have failed condition tests for device plugin. Uh, we're extending it and trying uh, to add more features there. Now, uh, device failure, uh, failure mode. As Murnau pointed out, when device failed, there are multiple, many, many scenarios. Like first scenario he mentioned is uh, let's just nuke the node. Like we know that it has to have eight devices. It doesn't have eight devices. We don't need it. Um, other scenarios is uh, other scenario is custom watchers that will uh, remove all the crash loop back often uh, in the inference uh, ports. And other scenario is uh, uh, how do we do port. Uh, uh, port failure policy so it knows about device failure. So all this we want to implement as a extensibility points and it's something that customers can configure because as I said, it's generic solution is very hard here. Uh, so a step zero is like immediate step we've taken is trying to expose device failure information in port status. So now when your port failed, you at least can look at the port status and see, oh, it's failed because of device failure. Now I know. Like, I don't need to code special error codes. I don't need to do any special uh, handling of the situation. I, I, just, I just look at the uh, port status and I know. Um, and then this extensibility point can be used by multiple controllers. It still will be do-it-yourself controllers, but at least they have information that is easy to obtain and it's reliable. 
And then next steps may be uh, we think in how to integrate this information in the pod uh, failure policy. Maybe we have a special policy for device failures. Maybe we'll have something uh, like that. Then uh, very big thing that we want to do is uh, to think how we can start unscheduling pods when something failed uh, and cannot be recovered. So if device failed, we know it wouldn't be recovered. We see it crash loop back open. Maybe we need to start unscheduling it. Kubernetes, as I said, never assumed that device can fail. Uh, it just doesn't know about this concept. It, is, it either has a device or doesn't have a device. So it will be a brand new concept, and unscheduling is something unheard of. Uh, and we will start exploring this area. Now, uh, for container code failed, um, this is a, a very interesting failure mode. When uh, we already know how to handle it. It's a code failure. Like, I mean, Kubernetes is all about making applications reliable, and like, if it fails, we know how to restart it. And as Brunal said, that uh, the problem is that it's not that we don't know how to handle it, it's just we're handling it in a very expensive way. Uh, right now, if you run a training job, and this job is like 512 pods, and one of these pods failed, Yes, you have a pod failure policy. This pod failure policy goes all the way to controller of this job. And this controller of job say, okay, I have one pod failed. I need to nuke all the pods. So it deletes every single one of them and then recreate every single one of them. Guess what? While it's doing it, first, devices are not doing anything. And second, something may race with this uh, job. So some inference will start working on one of the nodes. And suddenly you cannot even schedule your node there. So you need to deal with that situation now. You need to make sure that you pause everything on Kubernetes, like uh, like big pause on the PI server, and then you uh, uh, schedule your job. So it's, it becomes very uh, expensive and complicated. So what we want to do, and uh, this cap is coming soon, I hope we will start uh, discussing and maybe even implementing it in 133, is in-place recycle of pods. So you'll have API, and likely it will be local for Kubelet, that will tell that this pod needs to be recycled, it will be restarted in place, no reallocation, no nothing. It just, like, old container being uh, deleted, new container created in place, uh, and it will be very fast and very inexpensive. And it, uh, another extensibility point that customers will need to code for, but at least they don't need to uh, uh, hack around uh, uh, Kubernetes patterns. Finally, for device degradation, this is the hardest one. Like right now, the solution, uh, as Murnau mentioned, is like we, we need to pause all the, soft, all, all the uh, workload, test every device for benchmark, and then see, oh, this is outlier, clearly. We need to uh, delete this node and recreate it. Uh, it doesn't work very well for typical jobs. Uh, you don't want to run benchmark on, on all of the devices before or after every job. And uh, another solution Murnau mentioned is like, Measuring job execution, if it's running longer, then we will um, uh, recreate, like, we'll notify that, like, this job running longer than other jobs, so we need to uh, look at this device. So this also doesn't work very well. And uh, for that, we really want to get more insights from uh, device vendors to understand what's happening with the device and uh, does it work up to the standard. And with that, I want to thank you for all for coming to the to our talk. If you have any questions, please uh, go ahead. Uh, could you could you provide a little bit more details on uh, the use case for uh, in-place container restart without pod rescheduling? Because if uh, is there is a code issue which is, which is specific for, let's say, a bad shard of the data. Restarting in place will just keep looping over and over again without termination. What, what, what particular use case is addressed by in-place container restart? Is it like device remapping or? Thank you. So um, specific issue targeted here is, uh, imagine you have, um, so what, we observed as a do-it-yourself solution from uh, some of uh, very big customers is they want to restart the job and uh, they have a custom implementation of their training job. This implementation either wraps the job itself into um, um, some orchestrator and job itself and then it watch for total job uh, status, uh, execution status. And if it see if uh, one of the sports failed, 
execution status of a job will be cancelled and it will react on this execution status and recycle the worker job. And then it will recycle all of them except one that failed and one that failed will be recreated in, uh, uh, in a place that ideally you have an extra node that you can uh, put it on. If you don't have extra node, yeah, you, you need to nuke everything. Right, thank you. So you mentioned the, the concept of unscheduling as possibly an idea that could be native in Kubernetes to handle issues with devices. Uh, let's say for a second that that was something that existed today and you ran into a situation where a device failed on a node and it was reported as failed and Kubernetes started doing unscheduling on it. Uh, what would you expect to happen next after we unscheduled the workloads? So I think after it gets unscheduled, it goes back to the scheduler and it finds another device, uh, healthy device to schedule it with. Yeah, so we, we hope, uh, we want to uh, use it for mostly restart policy always ports. So right now, restart policy always says that, um, assumes that you can always, like hardware is always good, it's just logical problem somewhere. So we keep restarting you and eventually you'll uh, work out of this problem. With unrecoverable device failures, we want to say, like, it's impossible. Like, I mean, we can keep re restarting you, but you will never recover. So go away and, like, your controller will deal with that. That's kind of the idea. Okay. So, like, essentially, that we, we know that, that that node, that device is no longer working. We, can, we get the workloads off of it. We hope that, okay, maybe we'll find a new place for it. There's possibly another device, and maybe we have some elastic hardware, and we move it. And then, you know, at some point, we fix that hardware. Yeah, this problem we typically see on uh, smaller inference workload. Like, uh, it can play, find a place, like, I mean, it's a very bad situation when, like, you have a node and you, you have, like, dev healthy devices next to it, but it's still assigned to the same device because Kubernetes has no um, mechanism to unschedule and reallocate it to a different device. Okay. Um, maybe another question. Um, so let's say if you start seeing lots of device failures starting to, to pop up, and they're the ones that are possibly recoverable. But um, that recovery step is like a, a reboot on the node or an, an SBR on, on the GPU or something like that. And you needed to s safely schedule these things, right? Like you didn't want um, to affect any of the workloads on the node, right? Because we could be possibly scheduling new workloads or something else is there, and we don't want to reboot that node, right? So um, is there anything that like, we could do scheduling-wise to say, like, okay, this node is, has a problem. Like, we, we sort of see it as a repeat offender. We should probably start steering things away from it. Or even if we start seeing patterns, you know, we start detecting these device failures, should we start scheduling, moving things around, saying that, okay, this node has high potential of failure, we move away from it, or... Um, or even say like, okay, we probably should do you know, some work to SBR, or reboot this node in the future. So we should really start moving our devices away, scheduling away from, or, or scheduling our workloads away from it slowly. So I, I didn't get all of it, but like if, if we have this uh, status where we are surfacing the device issue, then the scheduler will no longer consider that device is available, right? Your DRA driver will be no longer be advertising that device. So if all the devices on that node are unhealthy, then nothing will get scheduled back there automatically. Right. So, so uh, yeah. uh, uh, let me try. Uh, so what I saw once, there was like a customer and uh, they had a port that did some GPU operations, but this GPU operation somehow broke the GPU every time. So it's like they scheduled, they run for five minutes, and they like broke this device, and then go to another one, and then broke this device, and then go into another one, broke this device. So this is a pattern. We probably can detect it, but uh, if this, this uh, port will keep going to the same node, we can uh, think that it's not broken, but in fact, the like, port is like incompatible in some way. Or if you go to different nodes, we can assume that port broken, but these assumptions start being complicated. Like you cannot really tell. Like, yes, you can say like this. This node is very faulty, so maybe you can assume that, but you 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 don't know. Like maybe it's a port. That's mm -hmm. why I think what that's why this like small um, steps approach is workable here. We will provide many extensibility points and try to 
cook uh, different solutions for different customers. And then whatever sticks uh, with the most of them will be uh, integrated into API upstream. I think that would be the approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I agree. Like sticking small steps and then people can experiment with it and then come back, oh, okay, this is another class of issues that can be fixed in the core versus something you're doing outside. Yeah, that makes sense. I get, like what I'm trying to say is like, you have these XIDs, you have these failures. It's, it's sort of like their information, like you were saying with monitoring and they can help us make decisions. And like, cause, I mean, there's so many things that could go wrong with our accelerators. We switch device drivers, we upgrade the device drivers, stuff can happen. You know, not just pods, but like things can occur. And so almost like assuming that that can go wrong and, and possibly making decisions as to, okay, taking the knowledge of, okay, this device is probably having a problem. Let's schedule away from it and do something about it. Well, yeah, thank you. I, I think it's a good feedback. Thank you. And we need more feedback. So if you have any uh, feedback on sensibility points we're missing or some device failures we, failure mode we didn't uh, cover, please uh, come to Signote and help us. Thank you, everybody.